Once again, we are thankful for your attendance here this evening. And as you look around and see the number of brethren who have come out, indeed, isn't this a sweet fellowship? You know, when I think about the fellowship that we enjoy here this evening, it brings back to me memories of the church that I read about. I didn't necessarily experience it, but that I read about in the Restoration Movement. Of how when the brethren came together for days at a time to enjoy a gospel meeting. We're not talking about just a few days, but I read that perhaps some lasted a month long. The reason being is because the fellowship was so enjoyable, the brethren wanted to be with each other to hear another gospel message proclaimed, to hear the songs, the songs sung, and the prayers offered unto Almighty God. And so when I think about a fellowship like this, this is something that I'm reminded of. If we are not enthused about an occasion like this, then ask yourself how Will you muster up the enthusiasm to be with your brethren in the eternal home with God? I read somewhere once long ago is that this service that we come together and enjoy is but a glimpse into what heaven is going to be like. But a glimpse of all the children of God coming together to praise and to glorify Almighty Creator forever and ever. And if we don't enjoy this time that we have with each other, how will we enjoy eternity with God, praising Him forever and ever? And so I'm so, so thankful for the brethren and for the gathering here this evening. Thinking about the gathering of the church and how the church once was, all of us, I think, knows of how the church is going and in what direction the church is going. It used to be that the churches of Christ were known for being people of the book. It used to be the churches of Christ were known for its great evangelism. In fact, statistically, it was noted that the churches of Christ were the fastest growing churches throughout the world. Of course, this was in the early 1900s. When we had many brethren who loved the Lord and who did not allow themselves to grow distracted by worldly and outside things. You see, that's the church that I want to be a part of and that's the church that I so desperately work for to see once again. I truly believe that even though we are here in this 21st century where we are bombarded daily on every side by technology, by worldliness, by denominationalism. I truly believe that we can still get back to that time where the churches of Christ are once again known by the world to be the people of God. And so again I say we know the direction that the church is going. And to some degree it hurts us. It hurts us to hear about this and that congregation that split over division, over issues that perhaps boil down to personality traits and personality conflicts. It hurts me to hear of brethren who could not get along in interpreting the scriptures correctly and seeing eye to eye, and so therefore they decided to go their separate ways. It hurts me to hear of congregations who have closed their doors because members were no longer attending. They never saw fit to give of their means so that they could continue the work in the local area and throughout the world. If you have kept statistically with Churches of Christ, you will know that this, of course, has been happening not just in the state of Tennessee, throughout the world. You see, our enemy, the devil, our adversary, is working against us. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 17, the Bible declares that he went to make war with the saints, with those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so we ought to wake up this evening and realize that we are in the midst of a battle. And this is a battle to the death. Make no mistake. Though we might not see it in that manner, 
Though it may be subtle in the way it comes as we drift away, we are in a battle for our souls. Well, because of this, many Christians have decided to throw in the towel because they hear of all of this division, because they see all of this conflict, because they do not see the church of the Lord as the church of the Bible. They decide to throw in the towel. They become discouraged. And over time, they begin to weaken and lose their faith. The Bible teaches us, as we will see this evening, that we can never give up our confidence. We must remain, even when the going gets tough, we must remain faithful regardless of how many it seems is standing with us. We must continue, even if we think we're the only one standing, we must continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only by word, but we must also continue to show it by our lives so that the world might know that there is the church in their lives. I call your attention to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and read with me verses 32 through 39. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 through 39. Yes, even in the first century, the apostles found it necessary to encourage the brethren due to a great apostasy that the apostles had, pro had prophesied that would come. And knowing, just like in the ancient world, Moses knowing that the Israelites would be stiff-necked and fall away, knowing that this would too be the case in the near future, the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament write, to that generation never to forget where they came from. Never to forget the great sin that they have been forgiven of, the great enthusiasm that they once possessed, and even though they might have found themselves in the stadium fighting against gladiators and wild beasts, even though they might have witnessed their families being drugged right before their very eyes and beaten to death, they needed to hold on to their confidence all the way to the end. And so in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32, the Hebrews author says, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an endearing possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. You see, the Hebrews author here is appealing to their remembrance, is appealing to the former days when they were first baptized. And to this I also appeal. Do you remember the days when you first heard the gospel? Do you remember the time when you were convicted in your heart realizing that you needed to be baptized for the remission of your sins? That you were at odds with the Lord and were not a part of His eternal kingdom? And do you remember the type of terror that struck your heart or the type of feeling that overcame you in knowing you had to do something. I had to get baptized. I had to have my sins washed away. And when that day came, you were immersed in the watery grave of baptism to rise up into the newness of life. And do you remember the great joy that you have felt on that day? The great joy when coming up out of the watery grave of baptism, you may have heard that song, Oh, happy day. Here in that great song, I have decided to follow Jesus. 
Hearing that song, I am resolved no longer to linger by the world's delight. Do you remember deep within your mind of when that day come and the joy that you felt of how you wanted to tell the whole world, you wanted to tell your father or your mother, you wanted to tell your brother or your sister, your friends, that you had obeyed the gospel, that you were now a part of the everlasting kingdom of God, and how nothing could have shaken your faith. You were ready. And so the Hebrews author is appealing to this very same thing. Remember the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Here in the first century, he tells them, when you were baptized and you were enthused with great joy, you were willing to lay down your lives for the Lord. That's what he says here. You, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. Not only were you one to endure this great suffering, but you were also one to be a companion of those who were also suffering with the same persecutions that you were undergoing. You all comforted each other. No doubt if you had found yourself in this time, perhaps you cried together. You prayed together. You shared war stories with one another. You sung songs to the Lord. And once that time came up, you both went home only to lie down with sweet rest in your hearts. You see, this is something that we can never forget because it's this type of joy, it's this type of satisfaction, this spiritual satisfaction that's going to help us endure even when we see the world crumbling around us. Even when it seems as if the churches of Christ are falling left and right. Even when it seems as if we're the only one standing, it's this kind of joy, it's this kind of satisfaction that's going to see us all the way through. But if we forget about these things, we will not be able to see these struggles through. And so the Hebrews author goes on to say, you cannot cast off. Do not cast off your confidence, which is great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. The enthusiasm that brought you here tonight, don't ever allow it to slip from your hearts. The joy that carries you to continue on every Sunday and every Wednesday and every church activity. Don't ever throw it off. Don't ever allow it to wane from your hearts because that's what you need to see this difficult life through. And rest assured that even though you may have been doing this 20, 30, 50 years, rest assured one day God who is faithful will come through in the promise that he has made with regard to everlasting life. And we will look back to this earth as but a dream. We will look back to this time as but a distant memory. Saying to ourselves, I remember the struggles that I went through. I remember how difficult it was when it felt as if my family was against me. When it felt as if the world was on me. And I wanted to change, but yet I held to my faith. Being there with the Lord, it would have all been worth it. Well, seeing that this is the case, we are reminded here this evening as Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 reminds us that we must continue to press forward. We must continue to fight onward because we have not yet apprehended but yet this one thing we know, that if we continue to press forward, we shall receive the prize. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. 
I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, there may be some things in our lives that, we, yet, that, that as of yet we have to get over. We may not have even forgotten or forgiven ourselves. You see, this was the struggle that the Apostle Paul had as he was one who persecuted the church. And throughout his epistles, you can read on certain occasions that he still felt indebted. He still felt indebted to the Jews and to the Gentiles for being a persecutor and injurious and a violent man towards the people of God. But even though this was the case, he writes here in Philippians chapter 3, he forgets those things which were behind and he presses forward to the things which are before he presses forward to the upward call and prize of Christ Jesus. And so we who are here this evening, who have made it a resolution within our life, no matter what, we're going to continue. The Bible tells us still, we must press forward. We must continue, even if it means we're the only ones standing. We're not the only ones in history who have felt this way. This evening, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three examples from the Old Testament that perhaps will give us some encouragement for this New Testament faith that we hold to. But in looking to these prophets of the Old Testament that will help us put into perspective that just as they may have felt that the world was against them, we too can learn from their obedience. The first example I call your attention to is found in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18. The account of Elijah as he withstood Ahab and Queen Jezebel. You may remember this account of how the northern tribes of Israel had departed from the will of God. And because of this, Elijah prayed that there would be a drought for a number of years over the people of Israel to demonstrate God's power, to demonstrate that the Lord was going to withheld, withhold His blessings from them as they continued in their rebellion. And here on this occasion, in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah tells Obadiah, a servant of Ahab, to tell Ahab that Elijah wanted to meet him. Obadiah was fearful. He was fearful that Elijah would not follow through with his word. And so in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 15, Elijah answers Obadiah and says, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. The reason why this was a fearful meeting is because Ahab had already been looking for Elijah. He wanted to kill him. He had already sent soldiers and companies of men to take Elijah's life, and now that Elijah here so calmly presents himself, Obadiah is fearful. And so the Bible says Ahab decides to meet with Elijah. And in verse 17, it happened that when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the bells. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. What we find here, number one, is that Elijah was presented in the scriptures to be a powerful prophet of God, but yet he daily had to deal with ridicule. Though he was a man who lived righteously and faithfully, he was one that was constantly belittled. 
He was one that was constantly demeaned by here, the King of God. Now just think for a moment, have you ever been ridiculed for the faith that you hold to? Especially in front of family and friends, or perhaps by someone of a high influence. How has it made you feel? And how do you suppose your peers on hearing that view you and have now perceived you? Well, consider Elijah's position as being a faithful prophet of God wanting to do the will of the Lord, but yet daily held in ridicule and in condemnation by this king. This perhaps would make many of us want to stop, want to give up. This would perhaps make many of us want to, to re retaliate in anger and say something back. But yet this did not bother Elijah. He stuck to his focus and he caused for the 450 prophets to stand there on Mount Carmel to find who is the true God. But we know how the occasion occurs. God proved himself to be the only true and living God. And when this happened, 1 Kings chapter 19 goes on to tell us that Jezebel became outraged. And in 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 2, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. You see, these were serious times. Elijah was there and he was proven to be the prophet of the true and living God. He had put to death these false prophets of Baal and Asherah. He had put them to death to show all of Israel that they were nothing and there were no one. But now that Jezebel, who herself was a follower of Baal, had found these things out, she threatened his life and Elijah was fearful. He felt as if he was all alone. Drop down to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Have you ever felt that way for the faith that you possess? having studied with someone about the gospel, about the church, about Christian living, and yet only to be met with ridicule, to come home and feel as if you have been rejected. To feel as if your words mean nothing when all along all you're trying to do is better someone's life or the community. Well, Elijah felt this way and he prayed that he would die. Drop down to verse 10. The Lord came to Elijah and asked him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. You see, the practical application of this that we're seeing is that as the New Hope Church of Christ, we might feel on occasion that we are standing alone. We look around and we see these denominations, or we look around and we see the world as if they are against us, and we might feel as if we are alone. We look around ourselves and sometimes we don't see reliability from our brethren. And it may feel that we're the only ones doing something. It may feel that we're the only ones up here working. It may feel as if we're the only ones preaching. And so therefore we get to feel just like Elijah, Lord, if it be, let me die now. Lord, I am the only one who's zealous for you. But what did Elijah have to learn here? Dropping down to verse 17 and 18, 
the Lord comes to Elijah and he tells Elijah I have reserved 7,000 in Israel all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mount that has not kissed him but Elijah had to realize that even though he may have felt alone, there were still thousands of brethren that he could rely upon and that he could lean upon for encouragement. And even though we might feel as if we're alone here at New Hope, we must rest assured that the Lord still has thousands that are not ready to bow their knees to the world or to denominationalism, and so therefore we can fight together. What about the brethren all across the world who are ready and willing to come to be here with us, to campaign, to go out and win souls here in this community? You know as well as I do, we can make phone calls and we will have brethren here next week if need be. And so therefore, when we get the feeling as if we're alone, let us remember Elijah when we get to feeling discouraged and depressed about the work that we're doing, let us press forward knowing that the Lord still has thousands on His side. The second example I call your attention to is found in the book of 2 Kings. Somewhat of a more obscure example, but one that is very encouraging to us. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we are now met with Elisha, the servant of Elijah, who was blessed with a double portion of his spirit. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, we find that the Syrian army had heard about Elisha and the power that he possessed, and so they were out to get Elisha. They had sent armies to surround the city, the Bible says. In verse number 14, they sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. They were there to get Elisha. And in verse 15, the Bible reads, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Can you imagine? You know, in Hollywood they do a great deal to depict these mighty armies that have come with horses and chariots and their bows and their arrows and their spears of how they are flung at the different armies and we stand in awe as we sit there watching it upon the silver screen but just imagine in reality the Syrian army who is known to be very vicious and brutal who would come and compass the city where Elisha was, here just a lowly man. And the servant of Elisha seeing this and growing fearful for his life. I can imagine Elisha calm. And he says once again, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. This reminds me of an old story that I've heard whether the details of it are true, I know not. But passed along by men who have known Brother Blue, Joe Blue. You ever heard of him? This was considered to be a man who was a very strong preacher, I believe here in Tennessee. And they said that he was met in debate by two individuals holding to a contrary doctrine and as they came up to the table, they opened up their bags and they placed all of their books and their dictionaries and their translations and they laid them all out. They pulled out their notebooks and their pens and their pads and they proceeded to get ready. But here came old Joe Blue 
coming up to the table on his side with a brown paper bag, places it on the table, and he begins to hear their opening arguments contrary to the will of God. And as they are going at it and preaching and proclaiming their ideas and their beliefs, Joe Blue opens up this bag and takes this apple and begins to eat it. You can hear the crackle of the apple throughout the audience. And the people, the brethren of the church, are just wondering, what is Joe Blue doing? Here, these men here are prepared. They have dictionaries. They have these pens in their pads. And they're writing on the board. And they're really going after these arguments. But old Joe Blue is still sitting there eating his apple. And when the closing arguments are beginning to wind down, Joe Blue stands up, reaches into his coat pocket, pulls out his Bible, and says, Little book, these men have now tried to go against your will. Can we defeat them? Well, I think we can. And the story goes that Joe Blue proceeded to answer every single one of their arguments point for point, scripture for scripture, demonstrating to them their misunderstanding and their misinterpretation of the Word of God to the point where these men recognized that they were holding to contrary doctrines of the will of God. You see, when we are looking at it in a visual standpoint, we might think to ourselves, what's going on? It might seem as if we're losing the battle. We have such a small congregation. There's only a few of us as opposed to many of them. They look as if they got their stuff together. They look as if they got programs and benevolence. But yet we as the Church of Christ have nothing. We might feel underprepared only to realize that the gospel that we hold in our hand is greater than the false doctrine that is being spewed by the atheists and the denominationalists and the humanists. We have in our very hand the words of God able to subdue the souls of men and to overcome his heart. And so we can say just as Elisha, do not fear for he who is with us is greater than those who are with them. You see, sometimes it's as if we need to have our own eyes opened and our minds checked because we have God with us, but yet we still fear about what's going to happen to our congregation or about what's going to happen about the work that we're doing. We hold doubts. We, we hold criticisms among ourselves. And therefore, we give up just like Elijah. This example here serves to remind us that as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's still a command that we are commanded to follow through with. Teaching them to observe all things after baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But what was the promise? And I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You see, Jesus has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be with us, but yet we act as if he's not with us. We act as if he's not going to fight our battles. We get afraid and discouraged when we find but just a handful Instead of saying, what the Lord has given me, I will work with and I will continue to fight with all of my power. Third, we go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 20. And we notice there, there verses 7 through 9. This is a familiar context. And you might remember the, the times of Jeremiah. He is known as the weeping prophet. And the reason being is because from his youth he was sent to the people of Israel to proclaim repentance for they were a very rebellious people. And often being met with rejection he wept tears for his brethren. And that might be the same way as elders and deacons and ministers of the body of Christ here. That might be the same way we feel. Or even as a member of the congregation recognizing our own inconsistencies, recognizing our own failures, we might feel sorrow for our brethren. Weeping tears and prayer 
about Lord helping us in the work that we are involved in to continue to grow, to save our children, to save our families, to save our friends. And yet daily met with rejection, it begins to do something to our hearts. It hurts. And in Jeremiah chapter 20 verses 7 and 8, he says, O oh Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I, and I have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out, and I shouted, violence and plunder, because the word of the Lord was made to me. A reproach and a derision daily. What Jeremiah is saying here is that he feels as if he's been somewhat bamboozled, as if he has been somewhat pulled over in the eyes, and, and he feels as if in doing so, he's been made to go out and preach, but yet in this preaching, he was met with rejection, he was met with belittlement, he was met with even to the point of taking his own life. And in verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more of his name. Jeremiah said, why am I met with all this? And why do I continue to put myself through this? You know what? I'm not going to preach this word anymore. It only gives me heartache. It only gives me trouble in my life. But as he made this conclusion, the Bible goes on to read, But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. You see, Jeremiah wanted to stop preaching because of all the trouble it brought him. But when he realized, as he was witnessing all of the violence and disobedience before his eyes, his conscience could not allow him. It was burning within his soul as a fire. It was contained and he could not hold it. He had to say something. Well, so likewise, we might be met, as Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 describes, with a rebellious nation. And it might be that they continue. Oh, those are those Church of Christers. Oh, those are those people that think they're the only ones going to heaven. Oh, those are those people who think that they worship better than everyone else. And due to this, hearing these rumors and this chatter among us and this murmuring, it might be that we say to ourselves, I'm afraid to lift up my voice. I'm afraid to make reference to God and true worship and the church. I'm afraid to continue persuading men that they should not continue in drug abuse or sexual immorality because of the great rejection and heartache that I have received in return. But we must be just like Jeremiah, having a conscience that never allows us to stop. We must continue preaching as 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 teaches us. Be instant, in season, and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm sure you've heard it said that we must be ready at all times. Preach it when they like it and when they don't like it. When it's favorable and when it's not favorable. But yet we must always do it. As the Bible teaches us, without striving, in gentleness and in kindness, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, it peradventure God would grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You see, we live in a time where it has become very unpopular to voice our belief in Jesus Christ and to hold up our faith in the Word of God and because it has become very unpopular, it makes us to feel or puts us in a situation where we are uncomfortable. It may not necessarily be as strong here in Tennessee as it is in California where I'm at. There to mention Christianity, you would be met with a face as if you are crazy. You will be met with words as if you are a lunatic or have lost your mind. You believe in those legends or those myths. 
And so likewise, it may be the case even now here in this community, individuals who have thought the same things. Or it may be because you hold to the truth of the church of Christ, you're met with the same type of derision. How will you respond? Will you give up? Will you become discouraged like Elijah? Will you be like that man of God, that servant, I should say, of the man of God, who is fearful for his life? Will you be like Jeremiah, who, who perhaps felt as if you wanted to stop proclaiming and evangelizing the Word of God? Well, I'm here to tell you, just as we've learned this evening, that there are yet thousands of brethren who have not bowed the knee to worldliness. That there are yet millions with us, God Himself walking with us, and He was promised He will never leave us nor forsake us. That there is still a conscience within our hearts that will not allow us to stop. But we must continue to proclaim the truth. As we conclude this evening, I call your attention to the book of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 15. The reason being is because as we conclude this lesson, all that remains is that we make a decision. You see, Joshua knew at the end of his life that in the generations to come, they might begin to fail the Lord. And so in an effort to hold them to faithfulness, he calls all the nation of Israel together on that day. And in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, he says, If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What is it, brethren? You who are here this evening, who have been met with these great difficulties, who have had these challenges within your emotions, and even these thoughts perhaps have passed through your mind, what will your answer be this evening? Will you continue to serve the Lord? Or will you allow these persecutions and tribulations to push you down to the point where you do not want to get back up? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If there is one here this evening, a member of the body of Christ, and has found themselves wrestling with this discouragement and torn with the idea of giving up, we call you back. We call for your return. The Lord Jesus Christ is calling for your return. The souls who have been beheaded for the cause of Christ are crying, How long? How long? And the Lord is saying, Not long. He is coming, and he who is coming will not tarry, and he has his promise with him if we will only remain faithful unto the end. If we have failed him, then let us confess our sin and repent of our sin, knowing that God will forgive. If we are not yet members of the body of Christ, we also invite you to look upon this great system of salvation that the Lord has offered, and even in times of trouble, he has offered he has offered encouragement. He will not abandon us. When we hear His Word, when we believe in the evidence, and when we repent of our sins, confessing Him as Lord and being baptized, He will never abandon us, but has promised us salvation and entrance into His everlasting kingdom with the hope of eternal life. But are you ready? And will you come as all together we stand and sing?